So, Turk, um, I don't know if you remember, but Jay Horowitz actually reached out to you last year because we were very excited about having you on the podcast. You were one of the first guys we wanted to have Yeah, on one the of podcast. the first people we thought of. We think, really? Yeah, we think we're going to Colorado. We'll get you in Colorado. And you got out of Dodge Jay got right us all we excited got about it. Hey, what was that, a baseball tournament? No, you, you, went, you moved to oh, Iowa. I moved to yeah. Iowa. You moved to yeah. Iowa, yeah. yeah. So what have you been up to? I mean, you've been... Well, I've learned how to play the trumpet. (laughs) (laughs) Are you better than Steve? Because Steve's a great trumpet player. (laughs) I heard he's really, he's a trumpeteer, right? What do they call him? I met Turk uh, yesterday, and that was the first thing he said to me. He said, oh, you're the guy that played the trumpet. You're a known trumpeter That's going to be on my gravestone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. But yeah, what have, what have you been up to, for real, since um, since you retired? I uh, just bought a farm in Iowa, and uh, we re- I rented a house for, well, it's still renting a house, but we're renovating the farmhouse that we bought, and uh, just trying to organize all that and get settled. So I'm not really not settled yet. What uh, What's kind of made you this outdoorsman that you've become? I mean, you kind of grew up in the Northeast, and you went to college in Connecticut. so. What what led you to this type of lifestyle? Well, uh, my dad, yeah. he he was he loved to hunt, and as a little kid, just following him through the woods. I, I mean, as, as long as I can remember, yeah. and then he had me bow hunting by myself when I was eight years old. So, <laughs> um, and a, a lot of I think hunting gets a bad rap from a lot of people that have ever done it. They think, oh, poor kill. You know, it's not about that. It's just about kind of being in nature and understanding nature and watching it evolve every day. It, it's pretty cool being in the woods a half an hour before the sun comes up and watching nature wake up and then being there and sitting till dark watching nature kind of go to sleep. But yet some things are waking up at that time too. <laughs> so yeah, it's just, it's, it's peaceful. It's relaxing. I don't know if peaceful and relaxing would have been the way to describe you as a, a player. Uh, yeah. you, you were a pretty colorful guy and had all the superstitions that went into it. What what kind of led you to being the superstitious type, to having all these rituals that you ended up having? Just through success and failure. I mean, we're humans, we're creatures of habit, and I'm pretty sure you got a routine that you follow every morning. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth, take a shower, you know, you throw deodorant on, whatever, you go to work, and if you don't shower or brush your teeth or forget to put deodorant on and you're you know you're walking around going do i smell or you just don't <laughs> feel 100 yeah, percent right so it's going to affect your day and as a baseball player playing every single day you start at the bottom and you have to work your way up to be at peak performance every day so i mean baseball players are just creatures of habit um i've, I've obviously talked about this a lot with a bunch of people and the funniest thing for me is or i used to say in spring training you start the first day of camp and there's 72, 75 players. And they'll say, hey, we're stretching on field five, go make you know, eight lines or whatever. And everyone just goes and lines up. And they're not assigned spots on the field, but every single day, everyone goes back to the <laughs> same exact spot. <laughs> <laughs> like they're numbered or your name is in the, in the grass it's somewhere. Just, it's, just, it's just creatures of habit. Do you, um, you know, listen, it makes sense. It does. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. But do you ever, you know, look back and, and get frustrated that people, the first thing they think of you is all of those antics? Because you were pretty successful. I think successful it's funny, pitcher. actually, because, <laughs> well, I got to the big leagues in 93. So 93, 94, I was known for that. Plus, it got a lot of hype and and pre-big leagues for me when I was in AAA with the Braves and then the Cubs. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first day of spring training in 95, um, Jim Riggleman, who's now the bench coach for the Mets, he's my manager now and he pulls me aside after practice and he says, look, I don't want you to do any of that stuff anymore. (laughs) And I'm thinking, you know, who the hell is this guy? (laughs) This guy's raining on my parade. It's the first conversation I've had with him. And he goes, I want people to see your ability and your arm. I want them to talk about your arm. I don't want them to talk about this other stuff. So, you know, it was tough for me to form a new routine to get into a comfort zone. And I was a starter predominantly in the minor leagues. So now as a reliever, I had to come up with a whole different kind of routine to pitch every day or possibly pitch every day than every five days. And... I mean, it helped me a lot mature as a player and a person. And uh, so ironically, 
from 95 to 2005. I never did any of that stuff, <laughs> <laughs> but everybody still wants to talk about it. So I played the next 10 years and don't do anything, yet people thought I did. Did, uh, did Harry Carey play that up? Did, did, was, did oh, that yeah. help you Harry being Carey, a WGN God, and all that? God bless Harry Carey. He was, <laughs> he was funny because some people would say, yeah, you know, Harry's on the air going, oh, I don't know why he does all that stuff <laughs> out there. It's, it's not necessary and this and that. And then I'd see Harry, you know, before a game or something. Oh, I just love watching you do all that stuff. <laughs> it's good TV, right? Right. Yeah. Let's go, you know, listen, and not to harp too much on it because there are so many great things just from a pure baseball perspective we want to talk about, but I am curious, even if some of these routines, superstitions, whatever you'd call them, were cut off, just the origin of each one. So can we just run through yeah, the list of them? Yeah, fire away. So, I mean, the first one that you're, you're known for most, just bounding over that foul line, how'd that come High about? High school, I, I went out, pitched an inning. I think I gave up a run. And I came off the field thinking, what the hell did I do differently? Mm -hmm. I remembered I stepped on the foul line. <laughs> and so that was it. That was it. Never step on no the line No more foul again. line. No more you foul line. Step lines. on a crack, break your mama's back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, what about the squatting on the mound until the catcher started squatting? One time I just I got to the mound before the catcher was ready or got his gear on, and I just squatted. And then when he came out, I just stood up and... Pitched well that day? Yeah, I pitched well <laughs> that inning, and then I just, if he wasn't out there, I would do that again. And, and it's just uh, its just weird how stuff evolves. Right. How about pounding the rosin bag into the ground? That was sheer frustration. <laughs> um, I remember in Chicago, I gave up a home run, and it was to kind of a no-name guy, a, good, you know, a triple-A call-up or something like that. And those are the guys that gave me the hardest time because I wasn't, a, it's like you narrow is focused. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when a closer comes in in a three run lead, he's usually not as sharp because he's, he knows he has room for error. Sure. Yeah. But you know, when you're a one run lead, so anyway, uh, give up a home run and as the guy circling the bases, I grab the rosin bag and I start cussing <laughs> at myself under my breath and get fired, you know, to get myself fired up. And I just started doing it ever since then. Um, you would wave to the center fielder before the first pitch. So that goes back to high school as well. And Jimmy Duquette, who's now with M XM Radio, was right. GM. SNY too. What, yeah. yeah, SNY. Duke and I grew up together. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know that. I mean, we've been friends since middle school or junior, <laughs> you know, elementary right. school. Played together in, in, in Babe Ruth and high school, Legion Ball and Collegian Ball. Um, so it, he was he was a really great athlete too. I mean he's like he's probably one of the greatest best athletes in high school that I played. Is that with. right? He was unbelievable. I, he would walk in the clubhouse and I would tell Reader and other guys, dude, you don't understand that guy right there. <laughs> he was a freaking stud. Yeah, no, we work with him. You'd never guess that. Right? He didn't. No, you didn't cross over with him as the GM here. Was he already? He was the already assistant gone? then, assistant. and he kind of he never wanted to really have people know that because yeah. he didn't want to think if something goes in the clubhouse it's going to be pipelined right. back to the front office or whatever. But but anyhow, so um, Duke mostly was a shortstop, but then he started playing center field. Well, go out and play, come in for the end, and he comes up and he goes, dude, wait till I'm ready. You threw a pitch and I wasn't even looking because I work fast. So after that, I'm, okay, and every day I'm like, Duke, you ready? You ready? Let's go. <laughs> That's so a, I just to make sure Duke was That's ready, unbelievable. Yeah. So Jim Duquette is the origin of you waving in the center field. <laughs> yes. that, that is pretty good. What, else we what got? about the black licorice thing? That, that was always one that so I knew about. I mean, people that don't know me think I'm this crazy wild guy, yeah. and I'm probably a big partier and this and that, but I just love to play, and I get super excited when I get a chance to play. And as a reliever, what am I get to play five, ten minutes if I'm lucky? Right. So, I mean, it's all balled into this deal. Mm -hmm. um, but in college, guys would chew tobacco and spit on your shoes. It was this game they played, and if it's spitting and hit your shoelaces, it was, I don't know, they hit you twice or something like that, but they got to wipe it <laughs> off. And it was just these stupid college games they played. Right. Right. Well, I didn't. I've never tried drinking. I've never tried tobacco, smoking, nothing. Well, I wanted to play the game, too. <laughs> So I started, my roommate from college, his Italian, his parents had a, a deli in Bristol, Connecticut, so he would bring sticks of pepperoni, so it made me look like I had a chew in my mouth. <laughs> but then I started thinking, wait, you know, black licorice, I love black licorice. I always eat the black jelly beans at Easter, that's the only ones I would eat. <laughs> and 
if I threw black licorice, it looks cool. It's just like yeah. a chew, and I can right. spit and play the game. <laughs> <laughs> and I could be a good role model for yeah. kids if they saw yeah. me and knew it wasn't tobacco. Right. So that's how that started. But then, is that why you brush the yeah, teeth? teeth? Because their no. teeth are black? No. No. Okay. So in rookie ball, I had a bad taste in my mouth. What'd you eat? I don't even know. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, I, yeah, I asked the clubhouse kid, the bat boy, to run up, I run up my locker and grab my toothbrush and went out and punched out the side the next inning. <laughs> All right, I got to do this now. So. <laughs> so it really was success and failure. That's really no, what it, it was. Truly, just whatever it really, randomly truly happened. Is. It, was, it really, truly. So, I know, mean, you really, if dude, you would have just you right had a couple now, of bad innings, you would have had a much quicker well, routine. Dude, if you, wear, if you wear some shoes that you don't wear all the time to work and you get fired, and the next thing you know, you get a new job and eight months, whatever it is, and you wear those shoes again to work and you get fired, you're throwing them shoes in the trash. Was there you're something that you again. stopped doing because of uh, a failure? That's something that you thought worked that maybe people don't know about that you stopped doing because it suddenly did not work? I can't remember, really. I, I <laughs> focus on the positives, yeah, the positives. not the <laughs> negatives. When did you start with the necklace? When did you... That was in Chicago. Oof, must have been 95 or 96. Any reason in particular for that? Um, I started hunting a lot more and was yeah. successful, and I just thought, you know, it, it'd be really cool to, to kind of pay tribute to the, to the animals that I've been fortunate to, mm -hmm. and it's trophies and the yeah. momentums, each of them have a special place. Did you ever let Riggleman wear it on the plane or something? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't seem like the type of guy that would, would pop that around his neck. But I tell you what, Riggleman is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, he... He called me in the office, and I think it was the 96 season, or 95, I can't remember. I think it might have been 95. But he said, hey, I just wanted to call you in here. I just want to say thank you for doing everything I've asked of you this season. You know, I really owe it. I owe you a lot. And I looked at him, and I go, what? <laughs> right. I owe you. Uh -huh. You are the first person to actually give me a legitimate chance to prove myself to, to be a big league player. Sure. I said, I know that if I go home this winter and something happens and I never get to play baseball again, that I belonged here, that I could play here. Where did that love come from? Uh, baseball. Of baseball. Yeah, where did that like really ob obsessive love of baseball come from? Because you even you um, loved it so much that your last year in the league, you offered to play for free. Yeah, I did. And I, I, I mean, heck, I'd do it again today. Look, you drive around the, any, any time in the summer, there's grown men playing beer league softball and they're pay to play because you got to pay fees to play, right? right? I mean, it's the greatest game ever. I don't know. It's just, uh, it's something I started doing when I was tiny playing wiffle ball. And I mean, it's obviously just a passion. And then to be fortunate enough to play it at a major league level and then get paid for it? Yeah. Really? <laughs> I mean, I would laugh. I mean, there's one particular time I remember, um, the clubby walking around giving us our paychecks, and uh, I grabbed mine and when he handed it to me, and Bobby V was walking by, and I just started laughing, and he goes, what's so funny? I go, can you believe I get paid to do this? <laughs> and I go, because let's be realistic. I said, if I do get to play tonight, again, it's five to ten minutes if I'm lucky, and if I pitch like shit, you're going to take me out. <laughs> <laughs> What uh, what was the trade like for you the, from the Cubs to the Mets? I mean, you, you came up in the Braves system, but you got to the big leagues as a Cub. So what was it like, and uh, what ended up being a, a trade with a lot of known commodities that were moving back and forth, Lance Johnson to Chicago, Brian McRae came to the Mets, uh, Mark Clark and Mel Rojas in that deal. So a lot, of, a lot of veteran players that were moved there. What was that deal like for you, though, to change teams and to be with a different big league team for the first well, time? Well, it was... The whole trading aspect of the game, when I got traded from the Braves to the Cubs, it it was kind of, I guess, surreal a little bit because that was the business of the game. Here I I pitched in double A and then triple A, and I mean, I had the best minor league season of my career at the time. And I'm thinking, geez, you know, I just had a great season. Why did they trade me? Mm -hmm. They got two big leaguers for me. So then I thought, oh, I wanted a legit shot to prove myself as a big leaguer because they traded two guys to get me. and uh, But then when, when I got traded to the Mets, um, it was a little heartbreaking. Uh, I went 96, I'm a closer in Chicago, and I had a really good season, saving 18 out of 21 mm -hmm. 
uh, chances. I think I went a whole month in Chicago because we weren't very good without a save opportunity. Um, but then I come over here and they have Johnny Franco and a lot of other big name guys, high dollar paying guys to be set up guys closers. Now I'm a long reliever. Hell, I never get to pitch. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like put on the back burner type of thing and finding a kind of a new routine again to be a different kind of reliever um, and just kind of waiting for my shot to prove myself. But the, the biggest, uh, uh, biggest thing for me that really catapulted me into the reliever I became was walking into Valentine's office one day. I mean, I'm the long reliever. We're in Toronto. And Hideo Nomo goes down with back spasms in, I think, the second or third inning. So I'm in the game. And I pitch one, two, three in the third or fourth inning. I go out and pitch the next inning. And then when we take a, I think we took a, about an eight-run lead or something, or five-run lead, whatever it was, mm -hmm. into the fourth or fifth inning of the game. And I give up a hit or walk to guy to lead off the next inning. And I threw over to first, and I couldn't help but notice someone's warming up in the bullpen. So now I'm pissed mm -hmm. because I'm thinking, well, what the hell? This is now my game. I'm the long reliever. There shouldn't be somebody warming up in the bullpen. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't help matters for me. Sean Green takes me deep, mm -hmm. and then he takes me out, and he brings in, uh, shoot, I don't even know how much. I think we gave up. I, mean, I should look it up for the story's sake. Right. But... It might have been like 14 runs that after that in, in that one inning. Mm -hmm. And the bullpen just totally imploded. Mm -hmm. And Mel Rojas came in and just, I mean, he couldn't get anybody out. But anyway, uh, long story longer, the next day I walked into Bobby V's office and I said, uh, you know, for me to be a better player and for if I'm a better player, the team's going to be better. What do I need to work on? Because I think this is bullshit that, you know, I'm the long reliever and you had somebody warming up when this is basically my time to shine. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do I need to work on to be a better player in your eyes? He goes, you got to get guys out. Bottom line is, you got to get guys out. I don't care how you do it, just get them out. Well, okay, who can't handle that, yeah, right? Simple enough. Yeah. yeah. So, now, we are 108 games into the season. And... So I would ever do the math. There's 54 games 54, left yeah. in the season. Uh -huh. 54 games left in the season. We come back to play the Expos. And we have a one-run lead going into the bottom of the seventh. Phone rings. Turks in the game. I'm like, what the hell? Because usually if it was fifth inning and the score was close, I could probably take some spikes off because I'm not going to pitch. <laughs> Seriously, and that's just the way it was. Yeah. So now I'm in the game, and I'm going, holy crap. So I go out there, and the first guy I get three and two, get him out. Next guy I get him three and two, get him out. Next guy I go three and two again and walk him. Now Mike Lansing's up, who's the righty. Bobby V comes out, takes me out of the game, brings in Johnny Franco. So now I come in the dugout, and I throw my glove. I go, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. You're bringing in a, a lefty to face a righty. Well, hell, you know, you got three, two on all these guys, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I go, bottom line, I got him out, didn't I? <laughs> that's what you asked me to do. So anyway, Franco ended up giving a triple to Lansing mm -hmm. and tied the game. I don't know if, if we ended up winning or losing the game. Another, probably should, for argument's sake, find out what that was. Yeah. But anyway. But it's not the core part of the story. No. Right. And, and for me, I wasn't that kind of guy. I was the guy that, you know, afterwards would go into Valentine's office and talk to him, you know, just discreetly. Mm -hmm. And for, for me to yell that and throw my glove down on the bench in the dugout and say that was totally out of character man i didn't sleep at all that night mm -hmm. and the next day the first thing i did when i got to the park um, when bobby was there was going and asking him i said i need to apologize for doing that and saying that mm -hmm. in front of everybody in, in the way it did and he said oh heck he goes there ain't nothing to apologize for i don't ever question stuff that happens in the heat of the battle mm -hmm. he said i know you want to pitch and you ain't afraid to pitch at any time in any situation. And at that time, I think we had 54 games left in the season. Mm -hmm. And I threw in 32 of those. Wow. So it just, I pitched every day after that. What's that like to hear from a manager? Um, 
Uh, and just to, to know that a guy gets gets it truly what it's like to be in the moment. Well, it's 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 reassuring that I mean it's really tough to you can't play as a player thinking you have to prove yourself on every pitch. It, it's reassuring to know that you know you're basically loved and depended on. And w without even having really to say it every day, it's kind of like having a relationship and knowing you're in love with somebody and not having to keep saying it, saying it, saying it, saying it, saying it. Mm -hmm. And even with Riggleman, uh, I hadn't seen Riggs for a long time. And he came and sought me out in Florida during fantasy camp, came on the field, you know, gave me a big hug. He's like, man, I think about you. I use you as a reference so many times to just the character and the work ethic and just the, the competitiveness. And I said, I can't thank you enough for being the player you were for me. And I'm going, you know, wow. He's coached a lot of guys. Yeah, he has. Why did you change numbers when you came to the Mets? You were 13 as a Cub and then you wore 99. Because Fonzie wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, Venezuelan players have a really big connection with the number 13. Right. And I think it's, I don't know if it's Tony Perez some Hall of Famer from Puerto Rico. I don't know. Jay Horowitz, who's that, Tony Perez? Concepcion. Concepcion. Tony Concepcion. Big 13 number okay. uh -huh. in, in, in Venezuela. And so he wouldn't give it to me. I had no clue mm -hmm. what it was. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, usually out of respect for players that have played. And I had a couple years service time at the time compared to Fonzie's rookie. Mm -hmm. But he wouldn't give me 13. And I didn't know the connection with the number 13 at the time either. And obviously Fonzie became a way bigger superstar mm -hmm. player and, and rightfully so deserved mm -hmm. to wear that number. But I just had no clue. And I said, uh, how about 99, Jay? And Jay said, Oh, that's pretty messed up, but you got it. <laughs> and then, so then I get traded to the Phillies, and I have 99 because that was my number. First three games give up walk-off homers. I'm like, I got to change. 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 Well, Tomas Perez has 13 for the Phillies. Venezuelan player, uh -huh. he wouldn't give me 13. And you know, at the time, he might have had two years in the big leagues, and now I have whatever eight or nine. Mm -hmm. And I was. I said, I, I, after giving up three bombs, I'm like, i got to get rid of this number. I mean, Mitch Williams was the last person to wear 99 for the Phillies, and we know how that ended for the Phillies in the 93 World Series. Right. Right. So I was in the bullpen, and our bullpen coach was also from Venezuela, and I said, to, I said hey, that's pretty messed up. I mean, I can't believe Tomas doesn't want to give me 13. I mean, I'm just going to buy him a Rolex. Yeah. He went, Really? I don't think he knows that. <laughs> I had 13 the next day. <laughs> Bottom off. Yeah. yeah. Um, th those teams, though, with the Mets, the 99 team, the 2000 team, I mean, the 99 team was, you know, just had a great run at the end of the season and, and some really exciting moments. The 2000 team has a, a really special place in, in Mets fans' hearts. As a, a member of both of those squads, do you look back on that time really fondly? Or do you look back on it as a competitor, feeling like you got so close and just came up a little short? I, I do look up. You know, we just we were the first losers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's just it's that bittersweet thing where you you know you you ultimately work your whole life. To me, it was playing in the big leagues, and a lot of the reporters say, "Isn't this what you're? Isn't this awesome? It's a dream come true. You play in the World Series," and I said, "I live my dream every day, putting a big league uniform on. This is icing on the cake." And ironically, people say, oh, that must have been super stressful, Subway Series. <laughs> I said, the funny thing is, the only time I relaxed during the World Series is when the game started. <laughs> there was so much stuff going on because the hype of the Subway Series and all the celebrities everywhere coming and going in the clubhouse and, you know, pre-9-11. So it was just a flood of people all the time, everywhere. Um, pretty exciting. But, uh, I mean, it would have been awesome to win the World Series, no doubt. But, I mean, there's definitely just special times to get to the playoffs in the World Series. And, and baseball is such a coveted thing to make the, the playoffs, let alone win the World Series, because ultimately, I mean, 30 teams, that's everyone's goal every year. Mm -hmm. But uh, 99, John Franco had played something like 16 years, never made the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And... It's not like other sports. In hockey, you really have to suck not to make the playoffs because every team makes it but one in each division. So, and it, you know, and I, I never really liked the whole tampering with the game. I, I mean, it just 
it really bothers me how they, you know, all this rule changes and speeding up the game stuff now. But when it went to interleague play and then it goes to wild cards, um, I think the wild card thing was good. <clears throat> I think it really helped the game. It it kept other teams in the game. Kept keeps fans in the game. Got sure. you in the World yeah. Series. It got me in the World <laughs> Series. Got me in the playoffs. But uh, I just think that a lot of the wild card teams are always playing hot at the right time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's because of death if your team is too good, because you've clinched the playoff berth, first part of September, and then they start resting guys, playing rookies and they think it's going to be just a light switch that you can turn on once the playoffs start, and they never get that mojo kind of lose, back. Yeah, you lose the mojo. Is that World Series, do you guys think of that differently if, if Seattle ended up beating the Yankees to go to the World Series, and it, it wasn't staying in New York, it wasn't the mystique of the Yankees, if, if some of that was a different opponent, do you guys think that you, you might have approached it? Oh, we win, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, <have> no idea. <laughs> I got no clue. Yeah. I, I just, I never thought of... Um, you know any other opponents yeah. as far as that goes? I just okay. We're playing the Yankees now, and and I want to beat the Yankees more than probably more than anybody on my team did because I'm a Red Sox fan. <laughs> 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 so that yeah. Do that you was, um? I mean, again, all this is just who knows what it could have, should have. But that moment in Game One where it looked like that was a Zeal home run, and then Team yeah. gets thrown out at home. Do, does that looking back on it? Did that change the entire? Tenor of that series, do you think? Well, that, that I don't know. I mean, you can. It's easy to play Monday morning quarterback. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got the Zeal double that Timo didn't run because he thought it was a home run. You got Pratt getting thrown out at home, and you know Cookie Ross taking a lot of heat for sending him. Uh, Benitez blowing the save. You know, I look back on it from a personal standpoint. I warmed up six times before I got in the game, and then whatever the eleventh or twelfth inning, right. got out of the inning. I mean, I was spent. Mm -hmm. Looking back now, I probably should have said to Bobby V, hey, look, um, we're lucky that I got out of that inning, but I'm done. I can't. But I never would ever say that. Right. I mean, you give me the ball. And then, <laughs> I mean, it's just Al Leiter had earlier, I don't know if it was that year, 99, I came in a game here at Shea, guy on second, two outs, Alfonso Soriano's up. And I give up a single to him. And he comes in and goes, dude, what are you doing? Get a base open. Why don't you pitch around? I said, Al, I don't walk anybody unless they tell me to. I'm trying to get the guy out. But, I mean, that was just my competitiveness. Uh -huh. And later learned to play the game smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't understand that whole concept of it was just yeah. kill or be killed. I think we should get a Jay Horwitz story out of Turk. Uh, we definitely need a Jay Horwitz story We don't have enough time about Jay Horwitz. <laughs> We used to, we like to ask all of our guests their favorite Jay Harwood story. That's arable. Well, um, Somewhat. gosh dang, there's you know, <laughs> there's the thing where it's just, hey Jay, what'd you have for lunch? Oh wait, let me just look at your shirt. <laughs> so he's, you know, he's, 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 he's yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Jay is definitely he needs a statue out here. <laughs> definitely is this important either. to you that the, this Mets alumni thing is happening now, and that and that you guys are are coming around and being more visible here? I think it's it's really it's a huge thing, and um, it, it gives other players, current players, perspective as to God, am I going to look like that when I'm done playing? <laughs> 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 but it, it's fun to to see the guys that you know you're you're basically family. You're around your mm -hmm. them more than your own family. You've lost touch, and, and it's easier now. I think than I think players in this era will have a easier time staying in touch with their teammates with. You know, FaceTime texting and all that stuff. I mean, it's an era that's coming into its own now, but it's great to see the guys and catch up with guys. I mean, Reader was my best buddy on the team, and we don't get to hang out or see each other all that much, but to, you know, hang out, it's it's like we've seen each other every day for the last 20 years. Right. Rick Reed. Rick Reed, that's great. Um, I'm going to leave you with, with this. One last question. The one thing that, uh, among a number of things, I should say, that, that was refreshing about your career is that you spoke your mind, and I think nowadays, we don't get that enough from these athletes, and I understand why there, you know, there are more reasons to be guarded. But was there ever anything that you said that you said after the fact? You know what? I, I wish I could take that back. Well, I think the whole calling Barry Bonds out on steroids was absolutely 100%. I said it, and I stand by that. But it wasn't in the manner I said that. It was a reporter not acting as a reporter, kind of as a friend in the Rockies clubhouse says to me, um, 
hey, what's your take on this Bonds thing? He didn't say, hey, I'm doing a story on it, you know, let me, let me hear what you have to say about it. He just, it was kind of like shooting the breeze with a buddy. And I said, I don't understand what the big deal is. I mean, he's, it's because he's very Bonds, no one wants to say anything. Mm -hmm. I said, look at the size of the guy. His, his personal trainers admitted giving steroids to baseball players. If that were me, there's no one would say, of course he's doing steroids, just look at the size of the guy. Well, he had a tape recorder in his pocket or something because I went and played golf after practice that day and my phone started blowing up and my dad finally called me and I answered. And he said, well, hell, you finally did it now. <laughs> and I didn't know what he was talking about. And I, he goes, you're not watching ESPN. Of course, it comes out on ESPN. Bonds calls me up in front of national TV. And so, you know, it, I can't even tell you how many guys shook my hand saying thank you. It's finally time somebody said something. Mm -hmm. But that's not me. That's not who I am. Um, and later on into that season, we're in Colorado playing the Giants, and Preston Wilson's walking out of the weight room, and the, the door's parallel to the training room. I'm walking out of the training room, and Preston, being smart aleck, goes, hey, Barry's in there, why don't you go say hi to him? <laughs> and so I looked up, and Bonds looked up, saw me, and he's like, yeah, you got something to say? Say it to my face. And there was probably eight or nine people in the weight room. And I walked right in, I said, I'll say you right to your face. And I walked up to him, you know, I was, wasn't invading his personal space, but close enough to be somewhat confrontational, I guess. And everybody kind of stopped what they're doing and got a little closer. And I said, I will tell you face to face. Yeah, that's what I said. And if you don't like it, that's too bad, because that's how I feel. I said, you're the one that's going to have to answer these questions to the day you die, not me. And I said, I will apologize to you face to face, man to man. That that got in the papers. This guy blindsided me with a question. I didn't, I didn't know it wasn't a, like a formal question or anything of that nature. I said, but if I'm going to talk about steroids in baseball, dude, I'm not going to talk about Barry Bonds alone. That guy better have a lot of ink in his pen, because there's a lot of guys that I played with that I know. I mean, Chicago, Sosa. I mean, why wouldn't I talk about him? Right. You know, he was my teammate for, I don't even know how many years, four or five years. But, uh, you know, and, and, and Barry was just, thought it was all about Barry and then ruining his reputation. How did he react to what you said? Well, he, that's what I was re you know, alluding to is he thought, oh, they're just trying to ruin my reputation, this and that, blah, 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 blah. And I said, well, you know, whatever it is, I said, like I said, you're the one that's going to have to answer these questions, not me. I said, but I will tell you one thing, Barry. You call me a p on national TV, the next time I face you, I want to drill your ass. Did you? I never got to face him. <laughs> you know, lefty, should... righty, so. <laughs> Do you think those guys should be in the Hall of Fame? No, absolutely not. Granted, it wasn't illegal or against the rules to do that, but, I mean, come on. They, they everybody knows, and, 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 and the sad thing is, everyone's like, whoa, Pete Rose, you know, but they also don't understand the whole story behind Article 21 in gambling and baseball, and that Pete Rose deliberately knew what he was doing, knew the ramifications, yet he still did what he did. And should, and Pete Rose's accolades on the field, yeah, absolutely, but he broke that rule and he knew the consequences of being banned for life. And, you know, I just, I think they should put some sort of, um, whatever you want to call it, asterisk, asterisk. or something that, uh, I mean, even though these guys weren't, I guess you could say convicted, <laughs> but uh, they were never, I mean, there's so many things that, just technicalities that got away with it. I mean, you could be the greatest guy in the world, but I'm not going to lie to you and go for go to prison for you, just to, like Bonds' guy did. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many days or years he spent in jail because he wouldn't testify. So I, it's just sad because, I mean, I guess the saddest part about all of it is these guys were good enough. They didn't need to do that stuff. They would have been in the Hall of Fame regardless. So I, it just kind of puzzles me that, you know, why did you do that? You know, Mark McGuire, unbelievable great guy. He's a great guy. But him coming out with an interview saying, you know, I want to clear the air and admit doing steroids. And they, he acted like the trainer made him do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, if I was the guy interviewing, I would say, well, did you feel like you cheated? And if he said, 
no, then why are we sitting here? Mm -hmm. You want to clear the air, basically, to get it off your chest. And tell me the ill effects your body has now so the kids watching this can understand that also. And why don't you give the money back then? All the money you made, why don't you give it back? Does it sadden you that your era is remembered that way? Oh, yeah, because, I mean, amphetamines were rampant. Um, guys were using cork bats and uh, steroids. And I kind of joke with my buddies. I go, damn, I must have been better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I'm going out there and I'm, I might have a, a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or something, whatever. And, you know, before the game, I'm maybe a little bit of a sugar or caffeine high. And I'm facing Superman. So, Turk Wendell, yeah. it's been Thank great. You very much. Thank you so much for doing this. Great to see you see back you here at City Field. Hopefully, not too yeah. long before we do it again. Yeah, tell Jay. Full time <laughs> job. <laughs>